good afternoon or good morning as the case may be. My name is Joe Moore. I am a registered nurse and a nurse practitioner and uh, I'm here to discuss uh, the uh, history of the Code Blue card and then we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, monitor on the defibrillator capabilities. Um, the Code Blue card was actually initially called a crisis card. It was um, uh, designed and originated by a woman by the name of Anita Dorr, who was an emergency nurse supervisor at a small hospital in the community of Buffalo, New York in 1960. Um, it was the responsibility of the emergency department nurses at that time to respond to the codes in the hospital, and so they would gather the equipment together and go running down the hall, probably half the time dropping the stuff because they were in such a hurry. So um, Anita decided that in order to be more efficient and to help her nurses get to the code scene uh, in a better manner, she uh, took some uh, very precise measurements of the defibrillator and all the equipment that she thought would be needed in a code. And uh, in, a, in her own home, in the uh, garage of her house, with the assistance of her husband, she built a wooden cart that contained all that equipment out of wood. She painted it red and took it back to the hospital. Um, well, the hospital loved it so much, they ordered four more in that very first year, and then, and then it just took off like crazy all over the country and all over the world. And traditionally, the code card is still painted red. Here in Southern California, they seem to like the Pacific blue. Um, however, um, Anita, unfortunately, did not patent her idea, um, but the original card does sit in the emergency nurse's archives building at this present time. Anita eventually became one of the founders of the Emergency Nurses Association. So that's a little bit of history of the card. Okay. Um, now, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, daily uh, system checks for the card. Uh, what we're going to uh, discuss now is uh, simply getting into the card and uh, being able to open up. Now, Cards will be different depending on the institution you, you work in, so it is important that you try to familiarize yourself with the contents. Basically, they're pretty much the same. You've got airway equipment, you've got equipment to uh, access the patient's vascular system, uh, you've got medications, and you've got resuscitative assistive devices. So, uh, for this particular card, the thing that you have to remember is most of the cards are always locked in some fashion, usually by a plastic device. So you would, you would just tear that plastic device off. This particular card has a lever on it that needs to be lifted up and pushed in completely in order to activate access to all the drawers, both in the front and to little um, compartments on the side. This particular card has IV tubing and IV fluids that are on the side of the cart, as you can see here. This cart also has its resuscitation board on the anterior surface. Some carts have it on the rear, so you have to make sure that you know which type of cart you're using. If you're doing a system check, don't forget to check the board. At one hospital where I worked, we were missing boards from the back because people simply didn't look behind and they were just large cutting boards. Maybe people were taking them home for their barbecues or something, I don't know. But we were missing a few of them, so make sure it's there also. Okay, so once you've uh, set your uh, board aside, then you should be able to go ahead and access drawers. Usually, on the tops of the cards are where the most urgent pieces of equipment are. You remember with, with ADLS and BLS, airway, breathing, and circulation. Those are the things that you want to access initially. Um, on this particular cart, it has a work surface on the top. This has got some equipment in here that you may actually um, need. The Yankower is your, one of your best friends in a code. Make sure you have a Yankower and access, access to suction. Other things are uh, flashlights, extra electro electrodes, batteries, and of course airway adjuncts such as oral airways, nasal airways, nasal trumpets they're also called. Um, and as well as a, a carbon dioxide detector for once the patient gets intubated. <clears throat> Some hospitals have an additional um, intubation tray sitting on top of the cart itself. Those are the tools needed by the physician or other practitioner in order to insert the endotracheal tube. Most carts, however, will have that intubation equipment, if not sitting on top of the cart, within the first drawer. As you can see in this drawer, we have multiple endotracheal tubes. Um, now, some institutions will have the actual um, uh, forceps and blades sitting in this drawer as well that the physician will use in order to do the intubation process. 
Uh, we don't have any of the blades in this particular cart to show you at the present time because this is a demonstration model. In the second drawer on this cart are just some IV access devices, syringes, um, needles, some saline, and the basics to make sure you have IV access. And this third drawer is a medication tray. This is not indicative of what's really in these carts. We use this just as a demonstration. But there's usually a larger medication tray of some sort within your particular cart. Now, these days we have to be really careful about uh, safety. So some of these trays also have a second lid or a second lock on them. So don't be surprised if you see that. Um, there have been instances, unfortunately, in this country where people have taken medications out of these trays while um, the team was working on a code and unfortunately have used those medications for adverse purposes. So it's important to realize that the nurse is responsible for the medications in this tray and to, to keep a close eye on them and to, um, to use precaution. This next drawer is additional equipment that is used for um, insertion of lines, sterile gowns, CVP kits, um, specialized uh, invasive equipment that might be needed. On the bottom of this cart is additional suction equipment. Um, just in case this cart might need to be used in the area of an institution where there's not wall suction. For example, um, somebody might code in the cafeteria. Now, we don't have suction outlets in the cafeteria, but we need the cart there. So, in our particular institution, the sterile processing department may bring a portable suction machine as well as an extra IV pole and an IV pump that we were able to utilize. Um, but that's there for safety measures. Um, additionally, on your cart, you have an oxygen tank, and uh, usually there is some mechanism to dispose of sharps. You can see on this particular cart we have a portable sharps container on the side of the cart as, um, as an assistance uh, instead of relying on ones that might be in the patient's room. And I think that's about it as far as uh, the uh, actual contents of the cart. Unless anybody okay. has any questions of your instructor, feel free to ask. I think I got it. All right. You want to just do the Zoll showing the monitor? Okay. You ready? You're still going? Mm -hmm. um, the other capability that the Zoll defibrillator monitor can do is, well, actually, two things. It can act as a monitor as well as a pacemaker, a transcutaneous pacemaker. This is an absolutely marvelous product, and it's relatively small. Um, in this institution, uh, we keep the defibrillator on top of the, uh, the code cart, and we realized, though, that it was difficult sometimes to keep these monitors from falling off. So what we did was we put Velcro on the bottom of our defibrillator and on the little cart that holds it in place, and that seems to work quite well. Um, the additional capability here is if you can use the defibrillator monitor simply as a monitor. You'll see here on the left side is one of your choices. Turn it to monitor, it will activate the machine. And now you can use and you can use this defibrillator monitor for telemetry purposes. You have uh, a three lead cable for um, electronic monitoring. Most um, without having to open up the cart, um, most carts have additional electrodes. Um, stored so that you have easy access to be able to utilize that. Um, for example, in this institution, if we have a patient who requires activation of the medical evaluation team, one of the first things we do is have the person placed on monitoring capability if they are not already on a telemetry unit. <clears throat> and this works like any other kind of monitor that may be in a teleunit or in an ICU where you can Use, you have um, hard buttons here for lead select size uh, and, of course, to be able to, to manage your alarm parameters as well as to record uh, the situation. Now, if you were using this in a code situation, of course, you would turn the dial over here to defibrillate. However, it remains in a monitor um, activity as well at the same time. Um, this training doesn't have time to really go into all the details of all the different buttons. You would need to refer to the manufacturer's um, 
uh, book in order to get that information. Great. Thank you very much. What's really nice about these new Zoles, too, is that you, um, you can... Um, type in right away the patient's name and uh, as you're giving the medication it, it marks that all for you on the, this mm -hmm. this one actually does that if you're if you're in a code situation this has what's called a code marker mm -hmm. and there are additional buttons that will um, will show up Check that. Um, you have alarms, you have different multiple parameters that can be uh, uh, identified mm -hmm. and on the code marker if you push that hard button, you'll see here it says CPR, uh, intubate, epinephrine, lidocaine, and there's even a list of other things so that you can actually then take you, the soft button underneath and press the appropriate button and that information will be printed out on the scroll mm -hmm. of paper as it mm -hmm. comes out. The one thing that you probably should know about changing the paper, this is one of the easiest paper change trays I've ever seen in my entire 30 year career. All you do is put your thumb in this little well push it down, and then pull the tray out toward you. The paper is nothing but a square box of paper that's fanned out. There's a hole in the bottom of the tray. You just put your finger through the tray and you push it out. To get a new um, set of paper, it comes in a little cardboard box like this. You tear the plastic off. You fan it out so that the arrows are pointing toward you, and you simply drop it into place. You'll know that your paper definitely has to be changed if you see near the end of the paper um, a reddish border. Mm -hmm. That means you've only got a very short amount of time left with paper. Anyway, the paper drops into the tray, and then you simply close the tray shut so that it snaps in place. Now, I recommend once you've done that, that you hit the recorder button just to make sure that it's going to run. If you see that it's running fine, hit the recorder button again and it will stop. And that way you know the paper's not jammed. Good idea. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we teach. Thank you, Joe. It's great.